Hello everyone. I'm Saloni Doshi, the founder and director of Space 118 in Bombay. Good evening for those who are joining us from India today and good morning to those who are tuning in from America early in the morning. Thank you for being with us today. Welcome to On Making, a talk series where we invite artists and curators to take us through the arc of their art practices and exhibition making practices in an attempt to understand how these practices will respond to the changing contours of tomorrow. Most importantly, we hope that these arcs that our speakers trace will answer for our viewers the age-old query of how do we make. This is particularly pertinent in today's context as art institutions across the globe reopen and reflect on their existences so far. Be it the Met that celebrates its 150th year this year, or closer home for us in India, a private body like the KNMA that's completing 10 years only yesterday. At a time like this, we at Space 118 feel that it is more crucial to bring audiences to a behind the scenes perspective into how an exhibition is made on a scale as grand as the ones we are featuring in our On Making series. So whether it's the years of rigor that finally bring an idea to fruition from the process to the materiality or the many hands of institutions and donors who lend invaluable support along the way. As an art patron myself, I have often believed that a landmark victory after putting up a great show is to get a great audience. So by expanding the reach of these exhibitions that have mostly taken place abroad, even further, especially in our currently socially distant times, is exactly the kind of platform we are ple pleased to be able to give to our speakers and the many partner organizations they represent. Joining us today is the first curator of the series, Amanda Stroka. Amanda is currently the assistant curator of contemporary art at the Philadelphia Museum of Modern Art, which she's joined in 2014, shortly after completion of her MA degree in art history at the Kotal Institute of Art in London. She focused on global conceptual art practices there. She has previously served as a curatorial assistant at the New Museum in New York. Her recent projects at the Philadelphia Museum of Art include solo shows with Jitish Kalat, Yal Bartena, Marisa Martz, and her forthcoming projects include solo exhibitions with Martin Sims, Sean Scully, and Lawrence Abu Hamdan. The Philadelphia Museum of Art is one of the largest encyclopedic institutions in the world with a collection that spans from the historical to the contemporary, from Asia to Europe to the US, from paintings and sculptures to costumes and textiles. With over 2,40,000 collection objects, the museum's holdings boast the world's largest and the most important collection of the conceptual artist Marshall Duchamp, the finest public collection of Auguste Rodin sculptures in the United States, and an incredibly and newly installed South Asian art wing that includes the historical Indian Temple Hall from Madurai, which Amanda uh, will share about soon, and she will even show you pictures. The historical South Asian collection is overseen by an Amanda's colleague and collaborator, Daryl Mason, fondly called Dale by all of us here. The Stella, she's the Stella Cramrish curator of Indian and Himalayan art. For those who don't know Stella Cramrish, she was one of the greatest scholar of Indian art. After having lived in India for many years, she went to Philadelphia in the 1950s, where she then served as a curator for the museum specifically dedicated to Indian and Himalayan art. In addition to her many scholarly writings, she also curated the significant exhibition in 1968 called Unknown India, which was the first scholarly survey of Indian folk and tribal art to be presented in the Western world. In addition to bequesting her entire personal collection to the museum, Cramrish also endowed the department chair position through her legacy and her commitment to the region, which continues to exist till today. The museum's landmark building opened in 1928 and is currently undergoing an expansion overseen by the architect, the famous architect Frank Gehry, 
and it's set to open in 2021. It will include new galleries for special exhibitions as well as contemporary and American art. I'll now let Falguni, who is our Space 118 Contemporaries Art Writer in Residence and the moderator for today's session to take on from here. Welcome, Amanda. Thank you, Saloni, for that round of introductions. And Amanda, have you with us today. I'm sure our viewers are looking forward to the talk through of your wonderful and still ongoing exhibition called Fault Lines, Contemporary Abstraction by Artists from South Asia, which features really a powerhouse list of artists from three generations. I mean, there's Zarina Hashmi, Nasreen Mohammadi, Sheila Gowda, Priya Ravish Mehra, and finally, Tanya Goyal and Prabhavati Mehpayal. For those of you who are lucky to be able to still visit their contemporary galleries, the show reopens in September and runs through October 25th. And I can't wait for Amanda to take us through her decision of situating the show in the contemporaries wing, as opposed to the museum's much renowned uh, South Asian galleries, which Saloni just spoke about. Uh, I'm sure Amanda and curatorial interventions to let us in on, and I'll ask her to take it from here. Thank you so much, Falgani, and um, thank you to Space 118 and especially to Saloni for supporting my work um, and that of our institution in Philadelphia. Um, I'm really excited to get to share with you all about this show um, and to kind of open up, hopefully, in a little bit, little bit in a little ways, um, the exhibition making process for you. Um, so as Saloni mentioned, I am the Assistant Curator of Contemporary Art at the Philadelphia Museum of Art here in the U.S. Um, for those of you who have not been to Philadelphia or don't know, um, haven't been to our institution, I'm just showing you here a picture of our kind of landmark building, also popularized by the famous Rocky movie. Um, and I've been at the museum for six years, um, specifically working in contemporary art, which um, for us means artwork created roughly after 1950. Um, but beyond this time period, I'm really fortunate in my role at the museum um, and that I'm not limited by medium or by geography in terms of my work. However, in an effort to grow the representation of particular geographic regions in the museum's contemporary holdings beyond namely white men from the US or from Western Europe. Um, much of my research related to collection building and presentations um, has been an effort to kind of expand that and to look at other areas. Um, and for me, that's been uh, South Asian art in particular um, and South Asian contemporary practice. Um, I should state, and as Saloni mentioned, um, the museum's historical holdings of South Asian art are absolutely incredible. I'm showing you here uh, an image of the 16th century Indian temple hall that kind of welcomes visitors to our newly installed galleries. And because of this historical strength um, in the institution's collection, it made a lot of sense for us to form a collaboration between the contemporary and the historical South Asian art um, departments. And um, that looked for us like trying to identify ways in which we can form a sustained engagement with contemporary artists from and working in the region. Um, and so the big reason why also my connection to Space 118 and Saloni here. Um, so selfishly, I was also really eager to take on this collaboration and to work with Dale um, who's the head of that South Asian art department, as Saloni mentioned, um, because when I was an undergraduate, um, in my undergraduate studies, I was able to live in India. And so this was a really great opportunity to continue to foster my own um, work and research there as well. Um, this collaboration also made a lot of sense because Dale, um, the head of the department in South Asian art, expressed interest in working with contemporary artists. 
Um, so I'm showing you here an image on the left, left uh, a still from a video by Shazia Sikander, which is now in the um, museum's collection. Um, and Dale and her then curator, Ainsley Cameron, invited Shazia to um, create a work that kind of reinterpreted and was inspired by um, a historical manuscript from our collection, which is shown on the right here. And I understand Shazia is actually participating in this on making series um, later at a later date. So that's really um, exciting too, to be kind of in that company. Um, but what does this collaboration look like for us? Um, a collaboration across our two departments is an integrated process of research, of cultivation, um, of acquisitions and talking about collaborative acquisitions, which when you're in an encyclopedic big institution, that could be a, a tough task even in and of itself. Um, public programs and exhibitions um, like Fault Lines, which I'm going to share with you um, in a moment. And um, because this series is focused on making, and in this case on making exhibitions, um, I thought it was important to dwell on the important role that research plays in this process. And that includes international travel, studio visits, um, cultivating new collections. Most recently, pre-COVID, uh, Dale and I were able to travel together to the DACA Art Summit. I'm showing you here on the right, here's um, Darielle Mason, um, and um, she's getting a kind of walkthrough with the DACA-based artist, um, Munem Wasif. And so going to something together like the DACA Art Summit is a great way for us as curators from very different backgrounds and expertises to talk about the contemporary practices of today. Yet the genesis of Fault Lines um, really begins with our discussion together around acquiring into the museum's collection the work of Zarina Hashmi, who I'm showing you here. Um, we, were, we were fortunate to be able to um, bring Zarina's work into the collection and to talk about the Fault Lines exhibition prior to her passing in April of this year. So we feel really um, grateful for that. You're seeing on the left a uh, work from 1969, um, a, an early woodblock print by the artist, and on the right, uh, a singular work from a number of prints that make up uh, Zarina's These Cities Blotted Into the Wilderness which features various cities from across the globe, from Baghdad to New York, um, that have been affected by violence and terrorism. And so having these two works, an earlier work and a later work in the artist practice, um, come into the collection, really uh, spearheaded for us, um, was a catalyst for us for a conversation about how we can get these works on view and where is their context really in our holdings, whether that's in um, the contemporary galleries, the South Asian art galleries. Um, and as um, Falgany mentioned, for us, it was really important that these works and that this exhibition um, be uh, in our contemporary galleries. And before going into the details of Fault Line, I just wanted to kind of walk everyone here um, who's listening in into, um, into the museum's galleries. And so um, here I'm showing you one of our iconic artist rooms. We are known um, for, for in our contemporary collection for these artist rooms that give us a glimpse into an artist practice and in doing that are able to tell a larger story about our history. So here we have a room dedicated to the work of Ellsworth Kelly, a key figure in American abstraction. We're showing early works that he was making in Paris before then moving to New York. And we also have an artist's room dedicated to Jasper Johns, another figure and um, an icon in American abstraction. And, um, but from a very different perspective than someone like Kelly and a different generation. And um, these two artist rooms actually flank either side of where the Fault Lines exhibition takes place. And there's one other room that was really important actually for the show and for one of the artists in particular in the show that I'll share about with you about in a minute. Um, but that's this room, which is a gallery um, that's, uh, that's currently featuring minimalist and monochrome paintings from artists like Agnes Martin to Cy Twombly. And it's situated underneath a ceiling um, this bright blue ceiling that you're seeing here by the conceptual artist Saul Lewitt. Um, so I just wanted to, to, before talking about fault lines, to kind of put us in the galleries for the sake of 
we can't be there right now. Um, and in some cases for a, a long time. So um, then we get to fault lines. And um, the, as I mentioned, fault lines is installed right in the heart of those galleries. And it's one of our large, it's in one of our largest spaces dedicated to um, contemporary rotations in the permanent collection. And I'm showing you here, I'll kind of run through uh, a selection of installation images that again, I hope give you a sense of what the show looks like, um, which is a special treat for me because the show was only open for four days before um, we had to close our doors due to COVID. So having these chances, even if they're virtually to share about this is really um, special for me. Um, as Falgany mentioned, included in this presentation is a group of six female artists. Uh, from three generations. We have Tanya Goel, Sheila Gauda, Priya Ravi Shmera, Papavati Mepayil, Nazri Mohammadi, and Zarina, all originally from South Asia, although not necessarily active in the region, um, which I feel is important to acknowledge when grouping artists together under this umbrella of contemporary abstraction by artists from South Asia. For example, Zarina, who I just mentioned, moved to New York in the 1970s, where she was contemporary with a uh, contemporary with figures like Anna Mendieta or curators like Lucy Lippard. Whereas an artist like Priya Ravi Shmera, um, for her, this is actually the first uh, presentation of this caliber um, in the United States. Um, so very different um, areas and places in which these artists work, were working. And I'm going to go in depth into individual works by these artists um, that are included in this show um, today. So joined by a preoccupation with abstraction, uh, the work of these six female artists also comes together beyond just abstraction through a mutual engagement with the subjects of home, belonging, and displacement, which can be understood from their distinct politics and poetics of place and of people. As we're now experiencing firsthand in a kind of global quarantine situation, these ideas of home are, are kind of hitting us in a different way um, as we talk through them, as we think about them, what home is, what home means to us, and what it means to belong. As the title of the show suggests, Fault Lines, these artists are also connected by their relationship to the line. Although abstraction has been traditionally rooted and the refusal of the figurative and the representational. What I hope comes across in these works and the work of these artists as we move through the show is that their lines serve as a map of and a metaphor for geological, political, and psychological landscapes. Um, through distinct sensitivities to rituals and to materials ranging from cow dung to copper wire to handmade paper, these artists root their abstraction in the real engaging with, again, the social and political circumstances that they both come from and where they're working. Um, so I'm going to start with the work of Sheila Gauda, whose um, sculpture here, um, Mortar Line, is kind of in the center of, in the, center of um, the gallery space. And although Gauda studied painting, she's now best known for her sculpture and installation-based practice. We have three works by Sheila Gauda in the exhibition, um, but this work titled Mortar Line um, is one that I'm gonna dwell on in particular. It's actually made up of a row of bricks made from cow dung, a particularly sacred animal in India and in the Hindu religion. And between the bricks, although not entirely visible here, but between the bricks are these red lines. And that's actually red lines made from kumkuma powder, which also has religious and social associations. And this red line coupled with the artwork's title, Mortar Line, a direct reference to a mortar weapon for explosives, for Gauda is hinting at and speaking to the increasing Hindu Muslim violence across the borderlines of India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh during the time of its making. This is a work from 1996. Um, but it's a violence that continues today and allows us to bring that conversation into our galleries. Um, it's interesting and something to note because we're talking about the making of exhibitions that all of the works that come into, a, uh, into an exhibition are reviewed by and talked through with a team of conservators who are responsible for the care of the object itself. 
And um, I have to say that this was the first time that our team of conservators um, did a report on an incoming work made from cow dung. So that was a particularly uh, special and fun moment uh, for us to kind of talk through what that meant um, and what that material means. Another artist in the show is Prabhavati Mapayil, uh, also based in Bangalore. Um, and we have on view a 16 panel work, a singular work in 16 panel, panels made from gesso and copper wire. Mepayil is originally from a family of goldsmiths and jewelry makers in Bangalore. And this heritage is often incorporated into her work, whether in material or in technique. Here's a detail of the work to I hope give you a sense, often these images don't do these works justice and what you get in person, but this detail um, shows you and reveals to you the copper wire lines that go in the work and in and out of focus, are kind of in and out of focus throughout the 16 pan panels as they're covered in layers of gesso. Mepayil's use of these more traditional materials and in some cases techniques were a way to bring new life and visibility to these, these kind of jewelry making and goldsmithing traditions and practices which are also being increasingly erased um, and or ignored. And so this idea of the line and the copper wire coming in and out of focus kind of speaks a bit to that erasure, um, although through a very abstract way. The next artist that we have is Priya Ravishmera. Um, whose works are shown here alongside um, that earlier work by Zarina that I mentioned. Um, and I'm specifically going to focus on two of the textile pieces that we have in the show. Um, Mera is most recognized for her textile work in connection to the weaving community. And particularly important to her process is the Rafugari technique, which is tr a traditional Indian darning or mending technique used to repair textiles. Um, most evident in this work here on the left. Now, Rafugari is said to bring new life to that which was once damaged. And for Mera, who suffered with cancer in the last years of her life, this mending is both a physical process as well as a spiritual one. And she talks about it in the form of healing, a healing that becomes visible in her words as she repairs the carotid fabric of life. So a metaphor in the repair of these textile works to the repair of life, which was particularly um, important to her at this stage in her life um, as she was undergoing, uh, undergoing cancer and cancer treatment. The next artist that I'm going to share about is um, the artist Tanya Goel, who we have two works included in the show by um, Tanya, one of which is, um, we are thankful, is in the Philadelphia Museum of Art collection. Um, and Tanya's work, like Zarina's, um, like I said, is part of the museum's collection. And um, we were really excited by this opportunity after bringing the work into our contemporary holdings to be able to engage with Tanya in a conversation about what it might look like to actually, for this show, do a site-specific installation. Um, Goel's works are often positioned in relation and in conversation with the grid, as you can see here in this work, with architecture and with color. Although inspired by the heavy rains of Delhi, Delhi's monsoon season, this work, titled Index 5, goes beyond the specificity of the Indian context to speak to the geological concept of deep time and to the global environmental crisis. The grid that you're seeing in this slide here is actually charting the changing global sea levels over time. And um, I'm, showing, I'm going to show you here a detail so that you can get a sense of actually the texture and the process because it was a really involved process for its making. And this is actually an earlier work that um, has been cited in other locations, but the first time that it's cited here in Philadelphia. Um, the wall drawing itself uh, is made from indigo, indigo industrial pigment and pulverized bricks. And the bricks um, Tanya herself collected from across Delhi, which is a very uh, changing city in its architecture and in its landscape. And both the indigo and the brick are applied directly onto the wall using a snap line. Um, you're seeing here a detail of um, Suhavi, Tanya's artist assistant, who came and actually snapped um, most of the lines that make up this drawing. And the snap line is commonly used in construction or in architecture as a tool for measuring. And so this is a work measuring the changing sea levels using a technique that speaks to the measuring itself. Um, I also have here a video 
um, that kind of records the making of the work itself. So I'll have this play as I continue to share with you about the work. And um, in this video, you can really see the kind of uh, process for mapping this grid. And, um, you know, that mapping includes both a digital mapping along the wall, like what you're seeing here, extensive tape and measuring processes, and the team that made up um, the kind of core installation group for this work, which included Tanya herself, um, it included her studio assistant, um, Sue Javi, and it also included a number of our art handlers from the museum's team, as well as our curatorial fellow, Alexis Assam, who um, was a key player in not just this installation, but in um, a number um, of the processes for Fault Lines itself. So I'm really grateful to her too. Um, we were fortunate to have Tanya in Philadelphia for this installation um, and to be able to bring her here to realize it. And I have to say that it was a special treat um, to get to see Tanya also experience the museum's collection and see ways in which works that are installed nearby to this gallery um, kind of served as an inspiration during this process from the lines of Agnes Martin's work on view in the next door gallery to the blues of Marc Chagall's work that was also um, and continues to be also near installed nearby. Um, so often when we take our breaks, the breaks would include um, running to the cafe for a coffee, but also walking through the galleries and getting inspiration from that. Um, so that was really, really special for me and I know for the team that worked on it. Um, an installation like this also was only possible um, with support from um, the Laobai family who actually provided us with the indigo um, that makes up um, this work that you see here. So we're really grateful to them. And um, the last artist that I'm going to talk about is um, Nasri Mohammadi. And you can kind of see here in the detail, in the installation shot, these three works by Mohammadi are installed next to one of the works by um, Zarina, which I mentioned earlier. Um, and um, I'm gonna go into a detail of those uh, three works. Um, it was interesting and important for us to include um, Nasri Mohammadi and Zarina's works together and in dialogue um, particularly as the, the two of them are really leading figures in abstraction, not only in India, but globally. globally. And um, at a time, I think what's really um, great about including Mohammadi's work in particular is that her connection to modernity and to abstraction was outside of the a figurative emphasis that really dominated Indian modernism in the 20th century. And so for, for Mohammadi, it was kind of taking this very pared down visual vocabulary um, and you kind of can just barely make out her lines even in these photographs. Um, and then she's translating her experience of the surrounding world and space and her experience of space through the line um, and really kind of speaks to a connection to architecture. Um, and I think, you know, she actually, in terms of her process of making itself, um, actually composed works like these on an architect's table. And so you have these suspended forms and kind of intersecting planes um, in her work that uh, kind of speak to a mathematical and a topographical approach. So it's, it's actually really wonderful, not just to have her work historically um, situated next to Zarina's for their different contributions in that period, but also um, in dialogue with an artist like Tanya Goel, who was also greatly inspired by architecture and a kind of mathematical looking at and mapping of um, space and place. And so, you know, what I, what I tried to do um, in sharing with you all about the show is just give you uh, an insight into some of the practices that, um, and materials that make up the show. We, um, as I mentioned earlier, have a number of works by each artist included in the presentation so that you're able to see in one exhibition, not just six artists in dialogue with one another, but different materials and techniques and ways of thinking that have also over time um, become absorbed by an artist's practice. So again, giving that, that picture. Um, and I hope that, that you found this walkthrough to be a compelling one, although, um, you know, PowerPoint slides and images can only do these works so much justice. Um, and as Falconi mentioned, we are planning to reopen the museum stores in early September. 
and um, the show will remain on view and through October. And so I hope that anyone who has the chance um, to be in Philadelphia or nearby will have the chance to see the show and to really um, uh, get a taste of what these works are um, in person. And before I uh, turn it over to our question and answer section, I also just need to take a moment to say that all of this work that went into this exhibition would not have been possible without the incredible support of each of the artists that are included in, in the show. I, I have to say that my conversations with Tanya Goel, with Sheila Gauda, and with Kalkavati Mapayil in particular, um, I really cherish them and, and I'm grateful to those artists and to the families and estates and galleries of the other artists who allowed us to include these works um, in a show in Philadelphia and in dialogue with one another. And I also um, just need to thank the lenders because not all of these works are in the Philadelphia Museum of Art collection. Um, and so lenders that include Shunita and Arani Bos, uh, the Frankel Foundation with a special thank you to, to Pace Gallery um, for allowing us to bring Prava's work here, um, to Thomas Urban, to the family of Priya Ravi Shmera, and particularly to Threshold Gallery for helping to make um, that conversation and collaboration possible to um, Gallery Mirchandani and Steinruka. Um, Ranjana has been amazing in um, supporting our institution and um, in bringing these works here. To the Peabody Essex Museum, um, I have to say that they were um, fantastic and Siddhartha Shah in particular was fantastic in allowing us to bring Nasri Mohammadi's work to, the, to this show and to the artist Sheila Gauda, um, whose own work is included. Um, in the show from her collection. And without the generosity of all of these players, um, this kind of show would not be possible. And what I hope in, in sharing with you today a little bit of behind the scenes and a little bit of kind of what into, went into the thinking of the show, um, you also understand that um, a whole team of registrars, conservators, art handlers, and special exhibitions team also contributed um, to bringing these works to this gallery, to Philadelphia. And um, you know that kind of work and my work at the museum would not be possible without support from um, our department heads like Darielle Mason and like my department head and, and contemporary Carlos Pasualdo. Um, and my last thanks are to you all um, for listening in and um, for joining me in all different time zones from all different places and parts of the world. Um, it, it really is a, a treat for me to get to share this with you. Um, and so without further ado, it's time to stop hearing from me um, and to answer some of your questions. Thank you, Amanda. My God, what a stellar list of works you've managed to bring together. And thank you for giving us that insight into what goes on behind an exhibition, you know, because we often think as curators, our responsibilities are more cerebral, but there's a lot of administrative lending and logistics and art handlers whose efforts are equally you know make an exhibition what it is so thank you for taking us on that journey i think it's so beautiful what you said in the beginning about all of these works coming from a formal language of abstraction and yet being rooted in an experience which is so real and so human. And to think it all started with the museum acquiring Zarina's collection, uh, a work of Zarina's for their collection. I'm going to ask our viewers here now to uh, put their questions in the chat and I'll start taking them as we go ahead. But to begin with Amanda, I want to start with kind of the obvious here. And I think you get this question a lot. Did you mean to make an all woman show or was this just a happy coincidence that's needed in our museum discourse today? Um, it was certainly not uh, what I originally, I didn't set out with this presentation only to feature the work of female artists, early iterations of the checklist had um, a range of artists and practices, but I think that, you know, what I, what, what kind of rooted these works together and ultimately what made the most sense for us in terms of um, the practices that these artists are doing um, and creating a succinct dialogue amongst works from many different time periods, materials, and um, kind of personal and political situations. It seemed as we started to kind of further refine the checklist and talk about it, that 
there's this undeniable connection amongst the ways in which these artists and these six female artists in particular were practicing and working. And I think that connection to material and ritual, although not um, solely kind of owned by a woman artist, um, is something that comes out in these works and I think ultimately makes for the, the kind of seamless dialogue that you're seeing. So it wasn't something that we set out to do um, or that I personally set out to do, but I think it does speak to um, maybe my own, you know, personal and curatorial tastes as well as um, the artists who I truly feel um, deserve to be on view and represented in museum collections like the Philadelphia Museum of Art. And taking on from, uh, you know, the, the idea of what brings these artists together, if we look at even the title of the exhibition, you know, Fault Lines, certainly one of the key binding forces here is the line itself, which, you know, the diaries of someone like Agnes Martin would tell us is quite literally an embodiment of a physical gesture. So I'm interested to know, what metaphors does the line hold for you? I mean, I think what, what I hope was able to come across in sharing just a, a detail of each of the artist works that's included here is that um, the line can be a connection to tradition in the sense of a, an artist like Papavati Mathayil. The line can be a connection to um, an increasingly heightened and violent political situation, as in the case of Mortar Line with Sheila Gouda. Um, or it can allow us to talk about uh, a kind of more personal experience, um, as is the case with Priya Ravi Shmera, personal bodily experience. Um, and that juxtaposed with someone like Tanya's work, which takes it from the personal to this global I think is, is showing these different approaches to the line and that a line is, um, as, I, as I said in the beginning, both this kind of map of a place or a position as well as a metaphor for um, experiences, personal, political and global. Um, so I think it has in, in all of these works um, offer a different insight into what the line is and can be. Uh, we have a question uh, here and it says, Amanda, I'm curious to know from you, what is the significance of mounting a show on, a, on abstraction in times such as these? I ask this as a fellow curator who curated a show on abstraction last year with Tanya Zarina Nasreen and was also asked this question. I think you know who this is from. Um, yes, I do, Mira. Thank you very much for your question. Um, you know, I think that um, as I shared at the beginning, these lines represent and speak to experiences that range from home to belonging to displacement. And I think that um, sometimes abstraction and um, Although we like we we think that it's removed, what I hope within this show is um, coming across is that um, abstraction is another language for us to maybe say the things um, that we don't have words for, and art serves as a tool for that as well. Um, and so, for me, what I felt was important not only because of the art historical significance of these artists and the dialogues that we saw ha could happen on our walls across region, across time, not just with this show, but with the other um, abstract artists that we have on view. But I think in this time, um, it's giving us a language um, for abstraction and, and these works are giving us a language for an experience that we also can understand through these three generations of artists that we're also not alone in what we're going through, whether that's a different experience of home or um, a kind of global quarantine situation is that um, there are these connections across people and across place. Um, and those are our kind of our own thread lines to connect us to one another. Um, so that's what I hope even in being able to share a show like this with you virtually um, is able to come across um, in terms of those lines of connection um, that we might share, even in a moment when everything feels disconnected. Oops. 
Thank you. I hope that answers Mira's question. And building on, Amanda, on this uh, idea of abstraction, giving us a language to talk about what we're feeling, what we're going through globally now, or say what somebody like Nasreen Mahmoudi or Zarina were going through in their time. I want to bring this uh, conversation to an interview you did with Tanya Goyal, where you said that a line is also an archive of compressed time. And that phrase is so interesting to me in relation to how we think of exhibition making. I'm curious to know, how do you deal with the notion of time as something that is simultaneously contracting, expanding, shrinking, especially now in our post-COVID world? And how do you deal with the archive of compressed time in an exhibition like yours, which features, as you said, artists across generations? Um, I love this question because I think that it brings it back to what, as curators, we get to do um, through exhibitions, which is really play with time. Time becomes malleable in a way. Um, and I say that because this is an exhibition that's in a singular gallery, one gallery, six artists, multiple works by those artists across time. And um, I think in a way it's like a compression of time in a single space. And so that's a big part of, of what we do when we put, we as curators do when we put these artists in dialogue with one another or juxtapose um, a, a work by let's say Priya Ravi Shmera from the early 2000s to a, a early work by uh, from the 80s by um, Nasri Mohammadi to a 1969 woodcut with Zarina and in a way you start to see how there's a not just a shared formal language but also how this kind of idea of time becomes open it, it opens up um, an opportunity uh, for us to think across time and so I think with an exhibition it's almost like this kind of compression of time and material and metaphor um, and then when you walk in, you're able to, with each work, kind of unpack um, those compressed layers. And um, I think I shared this with you when we were originally talking about the show is like, in a way, if you think of it according to um, like the sediments of the earth, and if you were to make a cut or a slice in the earth, you see these sediments that each, um, each layer tells you a different story about its time. And I think that's also, you know, what we're doing with an exhibition um, in a way is kind of unpacking those layers. Yeah, I, I, I love this idea of, you know, an exhibition being a compression of time in a singular space. And I want to go from the notion of time into the notion of space from there. Because the artists in your exhibition, they flit so easily between the domestic and the global, you know, the microscopic and the macroscopic. Because on the one hand, you have someone like Zarina or Priya Ravish Mehra, who deal with something so internal and so intimate, like the home and the body. Whereas on the other hand, you have a Sheila Gauda or a Tanya Goyal, who are talking about a kind of violence that is that that operates on a much larger scale and is kind of global in a way, you know, whether it's violence to the environment or violence to communities. So in the course of a singular exhibition, when there are so many spaces and artists flitting uh, across them and transcending them with such quickness, uh, do you think that for you as a curator, there, the exhibition holds and comes together to mean a singular space for you? And what is that space? Do you think this kind of a unification is necessary in your curatorial practice? Um, I mean, it's interesting, right? Because I think that um, particularly in the moment that we are in this idea of space and uh, uh, it's thought about that we're, we're not always talking about physical space in the case of right now, we're in a kind of virtual space, right? Of convening and of talking um, through an exhibition. Um, I think ultimately, and something that I, I truly miss um, is working with objects and with artists um, directly in a space like the museum, um, which is a space that for us, 
uh, in an encyclopedic museum, and this goes back maybe to why it was important to be in the contemporary galleries, is because you kind of have these like ricochets of time as you move from one gallery to the next, as you move from, in our case, the second floor galleries where you might encounter um, narratives and histories of South Asia, and then walking down the stairs through a number of other galleries before you get here where you, you're reading about a contemporary history of South Asia, an image of you know, something like Zarina's woodcut, that central line is a representation of the line of partition. Um, and so I think that um, in a way, space is necessary for the work that we do, but how we understand that space and how we understand the dialogues that can happen through art across space and time um, is constantly changing and constantly expanding. And I think we're becoming more, let's say, maybe experimental um, or open to how that might change in the current conditions. Um, and so, um, but space is certainly important um, and, and part of my thinking all the time. <laughs> Okay, for our last question to close, I want to go back to an essay that you wrote for Mar two years before you made this exhibition and to kind of go back to your preliminary thinking. And you used a phrase that immediately stuck with me. You said chemist and choreographer. And I think that so perfectly captures the essence of what so many of the artists are doing in your exhibition there's alchemy and choreography but you know i'm also curious about the choice of the word choreographer because there's something very performative about it and in art historical discourse we often think of abstraction and performance as if not being on opposite but at significantly distant ends of the spectrum so as a curator, you know, when, when you're putting on an exhibition, which is about abstraction, where the human figure is certainly lacking, that the body is not present in an obvious way, but we cannot say it's absent either. In making this kind of an exhibition, do you consider how closely the gesture of line making resembles performance? I think that what, um for me, that connection to the making itself is part of that kind of choreographic language that for Tanya, um, that, that essay, what I was referring to was her own walking through the city of New Delhi to compile materials that she would then pulverize and make into pigments that ultimately make up these grids, um, one of which is included in the show, or like the pulverized brick that makes up the line and the chart for index five. And, um, so, but I think that what, how that also applies or that notion of a kind of connection back to the body and to movement is emphasized in this show through the materials and the techniques that are used. So I think of, you know, going back to Priya Ravishmeras Rafugari technique, this idea of, of the mending and learn, you, you understand that there is a body, there are hands, there are, um, there are materials behind that making. And so I think that for me, that's, that's part of it. And then in some cases, um, there is quite like uh, a work I didn't get to share about with um, Sheila Gauda, but it's actually on view right now in the kind of slideshow of images, um, invites the visitor to be part of a physical experience of the work, whether through looking in and seeing um, this wonderful kind of punctured um, landscape of stars in that metal um, work or um, poking their heads into this dark space to invoke the kind of darkness um, of uh, homes that are found all across um, the world right now. But in particular, she was talking about the shanty towns in India. And so um, I think that there is this kind of inherent choreography that we do as visitors to a gallery space. But I, I, my aim in talking about it in relation to these artists' works was really about a kind of return to the maker and the processes of making. Thank you so much, Amanda, for that conversation. I'll now ask Saloni to come in for her closing remarks. Thank you, Falguni, and thank you, Amanda, 
for that brilliant conversation. I'm sure it's opened up our viewers for a great window into what goes on behind the scenes in terms of time, effort, and a beautiful installed show that you've just taken us through. On behalf of everyone who's viewed this, on behalf of everyone who will view it in the future, as it will be on our YouTube channel, and, uh, and all of us at Space 118, I thank you immensely. And it was a pleasure to kick start the series on uh, the curatorial round with you. I hope our viewers will stay tuned in for next week uh, for an artist talk by a true polymath in her own right. An artist with a set of diverse interests and making materials, Rena Banerjee. She's based in New York, but of Indian origin. She will take us through her fittingly titled retrospective, Make Me a Summary of Your World, which closed at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts last year. And we will be sending out uh, invites for this, but do visit our website, space118.com and social media handles to know about the upcoming ones. And we look forward to having everyone with us on Sunday at 6 p.m. next week. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.